change language. Can you do it again? Nope, I'm not doing that one for the video. Did you miss it on video? Yeah. Ah, too bad. Uh, all right. Yeah, this is the song of the King Penguin. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, this uh, this evening. Uh, thank you very much for coming out. This is a great opportunity to, to uh, hear a discussion on the Pope's encyclical, particularly given what uh, transpired today with the Pope uh, addressing Congress and in Washington D.C. and uh, definitely a, an opportune moment to be having this discussion here on on our college campus. Uh, so I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Lococo, who um, is goes way back with Dr. McGrath from uh, their graduate school days, and uh, much of uh, much of the work here is, is due to Dr. Lococo's efforts to bring Dr. McGrath here, and uh, so he can do the introduction, and then we will proceed. So thank you very much. I taught in biology here for, for a number of years, and I'm back, except this time I'm going to be teaching philosophy. Uh, Sean McGraw is a uh, philosopher. He is the head of the philosophy department at Memorial University in Newfoundland in Canada. And he has a broad range of interests in the, in the, in the field of philosophy, particularly continental philosophy. He's written about Heidegger and, and uh, uh, about uh, Various number of, of, uh, of uh, authors in the in the field of philosophy. He has a keen interest in in uh, environmental issues. In if you know anything about Newfoundland and the history of Newfoundland, there's been uh, in the in the recent years, in the past 50 years, uh, a depression essentially in the fishery industry there. The, the loss of the cod, um, essentially. A ban of the of the uh, um, catching of cod for industrial purposes, and a, a radical change in the in the, the actual culture of Newfoundland as a result of that. People who were fishing essentially for 500 years are no longer fishermen, so this has an enormous effect on the culture. And anyway, there's a very great concern about that issue. And in uh, um, Newfoundland, um, uh, the um, a uh, recent movement, that essentially spearheaded by John, to uh, um, bring together a transdisciplinary approach to the environment. In this past September, just last a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it? there was a conference. Which, I don't know if you would call it a conference, more like an event, an, an involvement of uh, scientists, uh, humani humanities people, art people from the arts from industry, from government, all got together on the west coast of Newfoundland and, and uh, um, engaged in what they uh, essentially is called the future of nature. It was a, 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 this event, I wouldn't call it a conference because if you've ever been to an a, a intellectual conference or a, a, um, a, a scientific or humanities conference, there's a certain level of intellectual uh, language and capability and so on so that will leave out your everyday person who does not have that language behind them or that experience behind them. So this was an engagement of all of this different, these different levels of people. And it was called the future. I'm going to read you the blurb from the little uh, 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 pamphlet that was given out for this particular conference. The future of nature is the, is the first in a series of public engagement events aimed at bringing together members of the community to discuss questions related to the environment, resource development, and the role of rural communities in sustainable living. The Future of Nature is a pilot project for, of, for a New Earth, an international research initiative that creates programs and interventions in ecologically sensitive places to inform, inspire, and transform the way we think and act in our natural and built environments. So this is what happened a few weeks ago, very exciting, and it's beginning, essentially the beginning of hopefully this type of event that can happen anywhere in the world through this particular organization. Sean is here to, to speak today about the, uh, um, the encyclical that uh, Pope Francis wrote recently, and it's very timely that he is here at the same time that Pope Francis is in uh, New York City speaking. And so, let, before I take up too much more time, we'll allow him to begin to speak on uh, this topic. 
John. Thank you, John, for organizing this. Mike, uh, Greg, uh, the Department of Religion, Biology, and the Sustainability Program for allowing me to be here. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, this is a very spooky position to be in. Actually, I'm standing before all these young faces and talking about the future of your planet. And particularly in this room, it's sort of like a kangaroo court experience. I feel like, you know, uh, you are my judges. And in some respects, that's absolutely appropriate. You should be judging me. You should be judging me and my generation and the generation before me for what we've done to your planet. Uh, and I think uh, that the the recent encyclical of the Pope is so interesting from so many different perspectives. But one of the, and we'll talk a little bit about why that's interesting. But what's interesting about this uh, this uh, encyclical is that the Pope is asking us to think about the future of the planet for you. Uh, Bruno Latour, who is probably the most famous philosopher in France right now, uh, recently gave the Gifford Lectures in Scotland on climate change. And he said at one point in this brilliant lecture, and uh, I recommend it to all of you, he said, do you notice that nobody talks about future generations anymore? And that's a chilling remark. That's a chilling remark. I think there is a, a, a deep-seated despair in our culture about the future. And I think there are very solid reasons for this despair. Uh, but we have to be careful, uh, because uh, despair does not lead to action. Uh, we know that the spirit of every revolution is hope. Uh, Ernst Bloch, a uh, Marxist philosopher at the beginning of the 20th century, noted that actually, without hope, people do nothing. It's very simple. If you don't think there's a future, why would you actually engage in the present in any way? And I think there's a great disengagement right now in our present. And I, it concerns me because I think it's actually, in a certain way, serving the interests of some people who might actually be profiting from the current situation. And in this context, hope doesn't become some kind of rose-colored glasses that we put on. Uh, it, it becomes actually a political act. And I think this is, uh, this is the spirit of Francis' encyclical. I'm, I'm actually stunned that I'm in the U.S., uh, not all that far from him right at the moment. Uh, this seems to be an interesting synchronicity uh, because uh, I, I, I'm, uh, you know, uh, from a purely secular perspective, I think that Francis has changed the game. He's done what no politician could ever do. He's mobilized one billion people. And he was able to do it without all of the hedging his bets and qualifying his language, which any elected representative or any UN official has to do. All that gobbledygook, he could drop it. And he could just shoot right from the hip. And he said things in that encyclical that I think have not been said in a public voice ever before. Or, uh, uh, and, and, and I hope they will be said uh, again, uh, because I hope he's changed the way we discuss this issue. So what I want to do with you tonight in about 40 minutes is just bring you into the encyclical in just a completely uh, superficial way, encourage you to read it for yourself, uh, because it's absolutely worth reading, and, uh, uh, and invite us to think a little bit further about what he's calling us to do as a public figure. So the title of my paper, or my lecture, is Climate Change and the Interval Ecology of Pope Francis. But I want to start with a term that maybe you, a term that doesn't appear in the encyclical, and a term that perhaps you haven't heard yet before. The term is the Anthropocene. Have you heard this term? How many have heard this term before? OK, not very many. I think you'll hear much more about this term in the very near future. The Anthropocene is a term that was coined in 2002 by a climatologist in order to distinguish the current age of the Earth from the pre preceding epoch of the Earth. The preceding epoch of the Earth is known as the Holocene. The Holocene is the period of basic uh, climate, cl climatic stability. So 10,000 years ago, the ice retreated, the climate became stable enough for human civilization to develop. We became agricultural, and with agricultural communities, we became civilized. That is, we learned to, we were able to specialize, we learned uh, to read and write, and develop language and science and religion and so forth. And uh, that, was, uh, that, that lasted, according to this theory, up until, uh, I suppose it's hard to date the Anthropocene, but probably sometime in the, in the, in the, in the middle of the 20th century. 
when uh, things began to change. The Anthropocene then designates an era in which the human species has become a geological force. So there is a debate uh, right now of whether the Anthropocene is in fact a scientific term, and I think the International Geographic Association is going to decide upon it within the next year, whether this is in fact a, a, a geological term. But what the term does, the Anthropocene, <coughs> the term which designates this era as the era in which the human species becomes a geological force, what it does in a single word is it, it uh, codifies anthropogenic climate change. Uh, because we have become ostensibly, arguably, a geological force because we've begun to change the climate. And the climate, of course, is what makes our planet different from every planet in the solar system, and for all we know, every planet in the universe. The climate is what makes possible life, and we have begun to change the climate, we have begun to change the conditions of life on the planet. Uh, so, um, the Anthropocene is a very interesting term for many, many reasons, regardless of whether the scientists agree we should use the term or not. But before I say a little bit more about it, I'd like to introduce, I'm not going to do a lot, I'm not going to go into philosophy in any big way for you tonight, and you can heave a sigh of relief. <laughs> I'd like to simply say, I'd like to introduce a distinction between a fact and a theory. Uh, a fact and a theory, because they're constantly being confused, right? And people are constantly taking theories to be facts. So, for example, it's a fact that there are certain rare species of turtles living on the Galapagos Islands. It's a theory that their presence is due to evolution. Evolution is a theory, it's not a fact. It might be a very good theory, but it's a theory, not a fact. Similarly, it's a fact that life behaves in a peculiar way under certain conditions. It's a theory. Einstein's theory of relativity is a theory to explain that, that property, not a fact. Similarly, it is a fact that the climate is changing. It is a fact that the planet is warming up. It is a fact that the ice is melting faster now than it has in 10,000 years. Uh, it's a theory that that's happening because of human activity, because of the release of CO2 into the atmosphere due to industrial human activity. So we need to keep those two distinct, uh, because even the naysayers of climate change cannot deny the fact of climate change. They might deny the anthropogenic causes of climate change, but they can't deny the fact of climate change. And so they have no real excuse not to be mobilizing every resource that we have on this planet in order to deal with the catastrophic changes that are going to come in your lifetime. Um, now, that said, anthropogenic climate change is a theory, but it's in it is, in fact, one of the best verified theories in the history of science. Uh, we have never put so much international collaborative science into a predictive theory as, with, as in this instance. So we're not talking about something wildly speculative here. We're talking about something that is actually uh, 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 as certain as we can get on the terrain of theory. And it's being confirmed daily uh, in various ways that will be confirmed in the future. Of course, at some point, we might find that there was some other thing that was causing the climate to change. So one, you know, and then we might have to change our theory. But at the moment, it's the best theory we got. So the Anthropocene is the term that says anthropogenic climate change. The human being is now a geological force on the Earth. Now, what else does that mean? Well, the Anthropocene means there's no longer a distinction between natural and human history. Uh, that's an age-old distinction. You know that you have natural history, geological time, dinosaurs, so on, plate tectonics, and then you have human history, you know, human culture. Uh, and often those distinctions serve various agendas. Well, the Anthropocene means that that distinction can no longer be maintained that human history now is natural history, and natural history is human history. Some thinkers would say this means that there's no longer a solid distinction between nature and culture, or between facts and values. Uh, Bruno Latour says that now they've become folded together like two ends of a Mo Mobius strip. So there's only one side to the strip. Nature, culture, human nature, human natural, fact and value, one phenomenon. 
But what does this really mean? What does it mean to say that actually now human history is folded into natural history? Well, it could mean a couple different things. For some thinkers, uh, people like Zizek, uh, Timothy Morton, the meaning of the Anthropocene is not the exaltation of the human, but it's the humiliation of the human. We're not saying, look how fine and great the human is. We're saying, look how degraded the human is. That the human is actually just something driven along on natural causes now that it actually perhaps in some respects is precipitated, but which it cannot control. So one can spin the Anthropocene from below in this way. But, uh, and one, but one can also spin it from above. So when we spin it from below, we say, human counting is nothing but a materially produced phenomenon, which doesn't understand its own effects. And like all materially produced phenomena, it will suffer change rather than deliberately producing it. So we, we get this kind of talk when we hear people say, well, human beings are nothing but animals. Human beings are nothing but matter and motion, nothing but so on and so forth. Or uh, my favorite uh, from a friend at grad, uh, grad school in, in Toronto, who used to talk about the Petri dish, you know? That you could take a Petri dish and you could reproduce, you could isolate bacteria in it and allow them just to proliferate and reproduce and reproduce to the point where they choked on their own waste. You know, that's the human being in the Anthropocene from this perspective from below. Not much hope in that picture. You can also look at it from above. You could also say, actually, that the meaning of the Anthropocene is this, that ecology, which has typically been understood to be a natural science until now, you know, dealing with ecosystems and the behavior of plants and animals and so on, ecology can no longer ignore the human dimension, since it is humanity that has emerged above all other species in the Anthropocene as the decisive agent the agent, the moral agent, for Pope Francis will say, the decisive agent whose actions will decide the fate of countless species on the earth. So that's Pope Francis's spin on the Anthropocene, which is the term he didn't use. That anthropogenic climate change means that now the human moral responsibility for the whole can no longer be ignored. And I find this interesting. After the tired environmental critique of anthropocentrism, you know, environmentalism is old news. It's been around for at least a half century. I'm not actually interested in it. I'm not an environmentalist. Uh, and then one of the recurring themes was, you know, we think too anthropocentrically, leading to some peculiar positions. For example, the human extinction movement. Have you heard this? The human extinction movement. The best thing we can do now is extinguish ourselves as a race. So let us voluntarily cease procreating in order to save the earth from the blight that we are. This kind of talk, I mean, trying to rally a political movement around that one, right? <laughs> uh, not gonna, not, not, not gonna go very far. So this old tired critique of anthropocentrism now kind of peters out, and we have this sober awakening to the reality of our significance for the whole. The Anthropocene that is spun from above by Pope Francis in his game-changing encyclical, Laudato Si. And I'd like to just read the preface of Laudato Si to you. Laudato Si is a, a, an Italian phrase from Francis of Assisi's Canticle of the Sun. This is how the encyclical begins. Laudato Si, le signore. Praise be to you, Lord. That's the quote from Francis. In the words of this beautiful canticle, St. Francis of Assisi reminds us that our common home is like a sister with whom we share our life, and a beautiful mother who opens her arms to embrace us. Praise be to you, this is the quote from Francis of Assisi, praise be to you, my Lord, through our sister, Mother Earth, who sustains and governs us, and who produces various fruit with colored fruit flowers and herbs. End of quote from Francis of Assisi. Now the Pope continues. This sister now cries out to us because of the harm we have inflicted on her by our irresponsible use and abuse of the goods with which God has endowed her. We have come to see ourselves as her lords and masters, 
entitled to plunder her at will. The violence present in our hearts, wounded by sin, is also reflected in the symptoms of sickness, evident in the soil, in the water, in the air, and in all forms of life. This is why the earth herself, burdened and laid waste, is among the most abandoned and maltreated of our poor. She groans in travail. We have forgotten that we ourselves are dust of the earth. Our very body bodies are made up of her elements. We breathe her air and we receive life and refreshment from her waters. Of the many things that is fascinating in that preface, not the least of which is the sighting of St. Francis of Assisi, is the idea that Earth is our sister. That's what Francis says. Earth is our sister. And in, in, the, in that metaphor of sisterhood, you get a sense of equality, actually. That, that this is, so that we're not on the terrain of Gaia goddess language here. Although Francis of Assisi is celebrated for being neo-pagan, but he's actually saying something that's deeply theological. Namely, that we are created uh, alongside many other natural things. And they are our brothers and our sisters. And we might have a distinct responsibility for them. And this is something that, that occurs to me often, you know? Because uh, when I talk to young people, they're always telling me that actually, how do you know that whales don't have uh, self-consciousness and that, uh, you know, that uh, elephants don't have interior lives and so on? And I always say to them, well, how do you know that they do? Show me the, show me the evidence. Without, and for a minute, diminishing the wonder, the beauty, the inscrutability of the intelligence of the animal world, we can say this, that their decisions will not affect us if they have decisions, but our decisions will affect them. We have a unique responsibility for the home. Uh, and this is the, this is the note that Francis is striking in this encyclical. No doubt, Laudato Si is radical. So when it came out in May, uh, I was in Europe, and in fact, I was lecturing on environmental issues the moment it came out. And of course, I rushed, rushed to see what, was all, what, what it was all about. But I didn't read the encyclical. I read all the press. It was amazing. The secular press was falling over itself, you know? I read Wired. I read The Guardian. I read The Globe and Mail. Uh, and they were just, the secular press was falling over itself in praise for the man with the big hat who was finally telling the truth. Yeah, you know, um, uh, that, that's what's radical about it, right? Poor old Benedict XVI, who could never get a press shot, right? I think the first picture of Benedict XVI was him holding up his hands and his mouth blew over his face, <laughs> and the German, Germans put it all in the press. And that was the end. But this pope, you know, has found that little magic touch which occurs every now and then in the Vatican where he can, he can reach into the, he can reach the hearts of people and he's, he's, he's grabbed them, he's, you know, he's grabbed their attention and he's got the attention of the world in a way that no politician could ever do it. So Laudato Si is radical, no doubt. But we might misplace the radicality of it and I think some of those secular writers probably do. What's radical about Laudato Si? Well, those unfamiliar with the long and venerable tradition of Catholic social teaching are prone to misplace the radicality of Laudato Si. Laudato Si is not radical because it speaks in an informed and critical way about economy, politics, social justice. So did Pope Leo XIII, Pius XI, John XXIII, Paul VI, John Paul II, and Benedict XVI. Laudato Si belongs in the social justice teaching of the Church, alongside Rerum Novarum, which was written by Leo XIII in 1891, an encyclical which broke down the barriers between the armies of underpaid and angry workers indentured by industrialism and the Church. Laudato Si belongs onside, alongside Quadragesimo Anno, the 1931 encyclical of Pius XII, which crit critiqued the immorality of keeping economic control in the hands of the few. It belongs on, alongside the 1991 encyclical Centesimus Annus, written by John Paul II, which reminded the world that before politics was reduced to an either-or between two equally reductionist modern alternatives, capitalism or communism, a third way was possible. 
A third way which neither denied the individual the right to property nor delivered humanity to the mechanics of the free market, but freed the individual to seek his fulfillment and moral perfection through his work while placing restrictions on the power of capital to level social institutions and dissolve communities. I realized I just suddenly left uh, you and went into my academic speak. Uh, forgive me for that. Uh, what I wanted to say was we have a brilliant, the Catholic tradition has a brilliant uh, uh, lineage of social justice teaching. And it is in this tradition that uh, Laudato Si belongs, speaking on behalf of the poor, critiquing political economy. So that's not radical. But what is radical is that Francis has connected the church's critique of social injustice to environment. That's radical. Too often, the environmental issue, the environmental crisis, has been discussed purely on natural scientific terrain. Nothing wrong with natural science. We need them. I'm glad they're here. But it's not simply a natural scientific pro problem. And and a natural scientific analysis of the problem leads to an overlooking of the social dimensions of the problem. So what Francis does in this encyclical, he says, in fact, what's happening to the earth right now is connected to what's happening to the refugees who are perishing in boats as we speak off the coast of Europe because we're building walls to keep them away from a place where they could live. It's connected to the people living in the sub Sahara Africa who who can no longer uh, eke a living out of the earth as they have for centuries, either because it's become desert, which is climate change, or even more spookily, because their land has been expropriated by large corporations, sometimes for the sake of growing biofuels, for the sake of greening the economy. So all of the upheaval that the world is suffering right now is related according to Francis, and we should understand the environmental crisis in relation to these huge social problems that we're facing. In a stroke, then, he's connected the social crisis of late capitalism, the amassing of wealth in the hands of the few, the disenfranchisement of whole populations of humans, and so on. He's connected that in a stroke with ecology, which means that ecology is not only about the interdependence of species and the ecosystems which make them possible, it is also about the interdependence of social injustice and environmental injustice. Social injustice and environmental injustice are related. These are the two ends of the Mobius strip that he's connected. The human predicament can no longer be separated from the environmental predicament but not because man is nothing but a clod of matter become self-aware or something, but because the degradation of the earth is essentially connected to the degradation of human society. The demise of one is the demise of the other, and vice versa. So I take this to be a very interesting move. I take this to be a correction of a certain kind of naturalistic ecology, uh, an ecology that would forget that there's a social and political context to the environmental problems we face. And that's becoming more and more clear now, of course, as we decide whether we will do anything to uh, curb uh, emissions. Uh, not, not for the sake of perhaps making the next 30 years better, but perhaps making the next, the next generation have a better planet. We're deciding whether we'll bother to do that, whether we'll bother to, uh, you know, factor that in to our economic calculations. Clearly, it's become a moral, political problem. Uh, but it needed somebody like a pope to spell it out. Uh, so let's talk a little more in detail about what's in there. Um, it's, a, it's a long letter. Popes tend to do that. When the pope writes a letter, uh, don't expect to read it in one sitting. You know? It's 150 pages or so. Uh, and in the letter, he says, I now wish to address everyone on the earth every human being, every person on the planet. This was kind of the phrase that just sort of struck me. Yeah. And he is indeed doing that. He wishes to speak to all people, not just to church, the church, not just to the Catholics, but to everybody who lives. And he wishes to speak about this issue, which is no longer a pet issue for an environmental movement or for the left or for the Green Party or whatever, but it is the one issue that faces humanity. And he wants to connect now loss of wilderness, pollution, climate change to a set of other problems that we don't speak enough 
of in, eco in an ecological context. That is, the loss of cultural diversity, poverty, social mechanization. In fact, what Pope John Paul, what Pope Francis does is he joins John Paul II and he launches a fearless critique of neoliberal economics, which is why he's become such a hit with the Republican Party. <laughs> Let me read uh, a bit. Page 15, um, show you the fearlessness here. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Francis on economy, on the free market economics. By itself, the market cannot guarantee integral human development and social inclusion. At the same time, we have a sort of super development of a wasteful and consumerist kind, which forms an unacceptable contrast with the ongoing situations of dehumanizing deprivation. While we are all too slow in developing economic institutions and social initiatives which, we, which can give the poor regular access to basic resources, we fail to see the deepest roots of our present failures, which have to do with the directions goals, meanings, and social implications of technological and economic growth. So you know the first thing Francis did today when he arrived in the US? He was in, I happened to see it. It's just one of those amazing synchronicities. I'm in the airport in Newark waiting to come here and have like 10 minutes. And uh, there's Francis arriving in the US and he's at St. Patrick's Church in Washington. And he gets up and he talks for half an hour about homelessness. And then he goes out and he goes and gives a special greeting and audience to uh, a selection of the homeless in Washington. This is, the, this is the Pope's primary mandate, it seems, is to speak on behalf of the poor, to make the church poor, and to speak for the poor. And we don't connect often enough the politics of climate change, the politics of uh, environmental, uh, the environmental crisis with the suffering of the poor. Um, in this regard, you know, Francis doesn't say anything super original. I mean, it's not, Pope shouldn't say super original things. I think it's bad business. So, you know, he, what he does is he draws on some great thinkers uh, from the past who have said similar things, in particular Romano Gardini. Uh, but behind Romano Gardini, there is Martin Heidegger, dare I say his name, uh, who had an unfortunate political history of his own. Uh, and other figures, too, I think of counted as George Grant, in critiquing the system of technology. Not technology itself, but the system. That technology is not a neutral tool which you can use this way or that. That's a myth. The truth is that technology <coughs> is an entire framework which changes the user and determines the way he or she uses the technology. So, for example, uh, you know, a computer seems to be a neutral thing. You know, you can use it or not use it. But a computer can only exist in a capitalist society where, with, a, with a, a certain kind of specialized infrastructure, factory work, so on and so forth. Uh, so it's a, a systematic, uh, it's a systematic uh, phenomenon. Or better yet, an automobile, you know? An automobile uh, isn't simply a neutral tool. You can't use automobiles in a, in a world without pavement, without, without traffic, without lights, without emissions. A whole set of, uh, of, of conditions are attached to the use of the automobile. Some of them are really pleasant. You can go wherever you want. Others are very unpleasant. It's very noisy in our cities. You, know? you can't hear the birds sing. There's no green space. We have parking lots everywhere. So the systematic nature of technology is something that uh, Francis foregrounds his critique. He says there are three false assumptions prevalent in our culture uh, which need to be corrected. They are the capitalist assumption, I call it that, the capitalist assumption, second, the technocratic assumption, and third, the modernist assumption. The capitalist assumption is this. Everything is for our use, and whoever can find and market that use is justified in doing so. If you find it, you can use it. If you can sell it, you can profit from it. Why is that a fallacy for him? It's a fallacy for Francis because it denies the intrinsic value of things. 
you know? The intrinsic value of things. Things that are good, not because they're useful to us or because we can make money off them, but because they're just good. You know, like the golden toad of Costa Rica, which is now gone. This beautiful little toad that when people saw it, it looked like it was dipped in, in gold. It was just a bright, bright little thing. It's gone because the puddles that it lived in have evaporated and it's gone forever. And who cares? We don't need it. We didn't need it. It makes no difference to us. Or the grizzly bear, you know? The grizzly bear, which used to range uh, in the mountains from Mexico to, uh, to, uh, to uh, the Northwest Territory. That was its terrain, this extraordinary creature, uh, ferocious creature, a predator of human beings. You know, It's now disappearing. It lives in a few corridors up in Canada and, and in the Northwest Territories. Who cares? We don't need grizzly bears. Yeah. But when you look at a grizzly bear from a safe distance, you see something that you can't help but respond to. You see something good, and you feel your own heart affirm the goodness of it. You feel yourself saying, it's good that there are bears, and the huge landscapes without which they can't live. It's good that they are there. That's intrinsic value. That's what is at issue in this fallacious capitalist assumption that everything is only valuable insofar as it's useful to us and we can make a profit out of it. The second false assumption, the technocratic assumption, it goes like this. And actually, colleges are, get themselves mixed up in this all the time. The system that created the problem can solve the problem. You know? uh, we'll figure it out. We'll design some really cool technology that will solve it, right? We're going to breed algae that's going to absorb all the CO2. Or the best one I heard is we're going to create this big exhaust pipe from Earth to space and just sort of, you know, expel all the CO2 that way. Don't worry. We got, we're just going to wait long enough. Or Stephen Hawking, my favorite philosopher, who said, we just have to figure out space travel. If we can just sort it out for two, if we can get by for the next two or three hundred years, you know, we'll go off to all those wonderful habitable planets out in the universe that we know of, right? Uh, uh, so this, what's problematic with this assumption is that it fails to see that the technology or the technological framework which caused the problem will not solve the problem. To solve the problem, we need to transcend the framework. We need to think differently. Uh, we need to have a paradigm shift. The third false assumption is the modernist assumption. The modernist assumption is the belief in progress. That is, that technology is the foundation of progress, prosperity, and freedom. As people, uh, as, hum as humanity uh, follows its path through history, it gets better and better. That's why the people before us were so stupid, and the people before that were so stupid, and that's why when you go way back, you have this, this, this ape-like being who can't speak. And so as we, as we evolve, we get better and better, and technology is part of that progress. You know? So this myth is enshrined in you know, sci-fi epics like Star Trek and, and so on. And it assumes, it assumes a kind of inevitable improvement of humanity through technology. And in fact, there's plenty of evidence to prove that that's completely false. I, for one, believe that Aristotle was probably superior to everybody in this room in certain regards. <laughs> Certainly in, in the way, uh, in his understanding of moral judgment, in his appreciation for the, the wholeness of things. You know, Aristotle has this amazing line. He said in the beginning of the metaphysics, he said, you know, Aristotle lived 500 years before Christ, right? Got that sorted out. So a long time ago. And he says, in the beginning of the metaphysics, he says, well, you can distinguish knowledge into two kinds. There's the knowledge that is useful for making things, and there's the knowledge which is just, you know, contemplating the beauty that is. And he says, well, since we've already made everything we need, we should dedicate ourselves to the knowledge which is the contemplation of all the beautiful things. And so this was 2,500 years ago. There's no steam combustion engine, you know. There's no modern physics. So we look at that and we go, well, what's wrong with him? Is he so dumb that he, like, duh, right? Why can't you figure out that we need to make all kinds of new things? Uh, the point is that actually he doesn't want to make new things. He's not looking for this bright new technological future. He's giving himself over to something else. Um, the point here is that progress 
is an ambiguous term, you know? In the middle of the 20th century, we woke up to the fact that we weren't such nice people in Europe, in spite of all our problems, yeah? Where we became the architects of one of the worst genocides in human history. Uh, and then designed bombs that could probably obliterate life on Earth, you know, well, they wouldn't if we let them go, you know, a hundred times over, a thousand times over. So what, what, where's the progress in that, right? Progress, perhaps, in a certain kind of efficiency, technical development, not much progress on other fronts. Um, so these are the false assumptions. And what does Francis offer as a solution to this? Well, I don't think he really has the solution. And we won't give him a hard time for that, because I think that's another false assumption. That if you don't have the solution, you're not allowed to discuss the problem. I think that's a deeply flawed idea. You know, it might be the case that we haven't discussed the problem clearly enough, and therefore we have no solutions. It might be the case that we need to discuss the problem much more clearly than we have, in a much more developed way. We, might, we need to think much harder about it before we can even begin to discuss solutions. I think that's what Francis is doing in this encyclical, calling us to do in this encyclical, to think more clearly about the problem we are all facing. Uh, and he offers, uh, as a kind of way forward, what he calls integral ecology, integral ecology, the ecology that integrates. What does he mean by this term? Well, there's a history to this term. And the, he doesn't actually want to perpetuate any of the historical uses of the word integral. So, for example, there's a kind of there's a philosopher, pop philosopher named Ken Wilber, who talks about integral studies, which is this grand theory of everything, which shows that everything interconnects with everything else. That's not what Francis is talking about. He doesn't have a grand theory, and he's not even looking for one. And there's also, of course, the Buddhist doctrine of interdependence, you know, which is very popular in secular uh, environmental circles. Everything depends on everything else. There's a deep metaphysical principle in Hinduism that articulates the interdependence of everything and everything else. That's not what he means either. What he means is that all of the crises that humanity faces right now are connected. So all of the economic disparity that we are suffering right now, all of the competition for resources, all of the degradation of the natural world, the failure of our nation states, the failure of our politics, the loss of our political sense, the loss of our freedom, uh, and a climate on the verge of spinning out of control. These problems are actually connected. They're not different things. They're actually different sides of one thing. One thing that we need to think much, much more clearly about. The problem of our home. On care for our common home. Oikos is the Greek word for home. So ecology comes from two Greek words, oikos and logos. Home and word, logos, or logic. The logic of our home, or the science of our home, or what we should say about living well in our home. That's what ecology is. And so Francis wants to not simply stay with environmental ecology. He wants to connect environmental ecology to economic ecology. And he wants to connect economic ecology to social ecology. And in this regard, he says some extraordinary things. For example, the disappearance of cultural diversity in human species. That is, the homogenization of the human community. You know, uh, when I went to India in 1987, there was still a distinct culture there. I went to India last year, and it's gone. It's entirely gone. They look like us, they dress like us, they talk like us, they shop, they buy the same things, they watch the same movies, they read the same books. And this is happening everywhere. We're becoming one monoculture around the world through globalization. This is bringing about a lot of good things, you know. Uh, certainly we're much more aware of certain kinds of problems in different parts of the world, but we've lost a certain kind of cultural diversity. And Francis says that this is lamentable. He says, I quote, the disappearance of a culture can be just as serious or even more serious than the disappearance of a species of plant or animal. I'm still quoting, the imposition of a dominant lifestyle linked to a single form of production can be just as harmful as the altering of ecosystems. Now, I'm a Newfoundlander, and I could say a lot more about what's happened to my home and my nation, but perhaps in the interest of time, I'll simply leave you with this, that Francis <coughs> wishes us to connect the loss of biodiversity with the loss of cultural diversity. 
What would it mean to connect those things? Well, I think what it would mean is a direct engagement with our what he calls techno economics, because it's the same it's the same political economic structure that is responsible for both. So the encyclical is in fact a critique of economy. <clears throat> Climate change is the failure of an economy based on profit alone. How do we get out of this? There needs to be a total transformation in how we buy and sell and trade amongst ourselves. A complete transformation. Francis is calling for nothing less than the end of consumer capitalism. Now he doesn't say it so directly, but I don't want to say it. He's calling for the end of consumer capitalism. Now this is difficult for us because as someone said, it's easier for us to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. <laughs> and it's true, isn't it? We, now if that's the case, we're suffering from a failure of imagination. You know, we didn't always live this way. There are plenty of examples in the past of how we live differently. I'm not saying that we can just go back there and resurrect them, but I'm simply saying that there's no essential connection, essential connection between consumer capitalism and human flourishing. In fact, quite the opposite seems to be the case. It is possible that we could live differently. And Francis wishes to call us to think much, much more deeply about what that could be. And I think to engage in acts of imagination, Brave acts of specula speculation, just go wild. Just imagine a future that's different than the present. And when we do so, I think we will engage our hope and we will engage our time in a much, much more effective way. Green economic strategies are not radical enough. He's not all that fond of the solutions on the table. For example, carbon credits, right? Rather than leading to a reduction, you know what carbon credits are, right? So the, <coughs> the polluter pays for his pollution in these carbon credits. Rather than leading to a reduction of CO2, he says, this may simply be a ploy which permits maintaining the excessive consumption of some countries and sectors. In other words, the rich ones can pollute and the poor ones can't. Similar problem with raising the prices on carbon, right? Let's just make fossil fuels more expensive. Well, what will this do? He suggests that this will just worsen the plight of the poor, the poor who need energy as much or more than the rich. And my final point, the climate is our common good. In a book called This Changes Everything, Naomi Klein states bluntly, climate change isn't an issue to add to the list of things to worry about, next to health care and taxes. It is a civilizational wake-up call. I think you know the grim details. I don't have to rehearse them. Right now there are 20 million refugees in the world. Over 50% of them are children. Many of them are refugees from climate change. That number is going to exponentially increase in the next 35 years as the sea levels rise to as much as 10 feet and weather becomes more erratic. Before you start thinking, like we might in Newfoundland, that wow, we're going to become a paradise. Uh, we have to recognize what, is, what the warming of the north will mean. Humans and anim animals are already migrating from the equators to the poles. That's ha happening right now in Europe. And if, they cannot, if these species cannot outpace the warming climate, they will go extinct. As the levels of CO2 increase, the oceans, which are absorbing the gas, will become more acidic, leading to the, leading to the extinction of much marine life. Certain kinds of diseases and bacteria, which never existed to the, in the north because it was too cold, will suddenly appear. And we'll see the sudden extinction of whole species of animals in the north, the caribou and the polar bears and so on. The boreal region of the world, you know, the, the, uh, the cold water area of the world, which is not an agricultural belt, it will become a place for growing food for the first time in human history. As what we now know as our agricultural belt becomes a desert. Uh, but this will be accompanied by a loss of security, food security worldwide, which will create havoc uh, on food markets, spark famines, riots, political instability, and civil unrest on a scale not seen in modern times. So th these are things that you've heard before, and we don't, need to, we don't need to dwell on them in some kind of morbid way, but they are actually they're actually solid predictions based on facts, not theory. The fact of the warming planet. So, um, 
the last point then is uh, just a word on um, on a philosophical point. Um, Francis has a section in the, in the letter where he says, the climate is our common good. That the common good is not a term that has much purchase outside of Catholic circles. It's, uh, it's an old fashioned word. It's a word that comes from pre-modern times. So our, our ethics is basically utilitarian. We, we basically call that good, which is useful to us. And we understand that which we have in common to be that which we can agree to share upon. So we enter into social contracts with each other, we don't really belong to each other, and nothing is intrinsically good in itself. Well, Francis, belonging to one of the uh, most conservative institutions in the world, doesn't believe this is the case. In fact, the Roman Catholic Church, arguably, is, is, is the one institution in the world that perpetuates traditions from the Middle Ages and the ancient world. So when he speaks of the common good, he's speaking of this robust tradition back to Thomas Aquinas and even Aristotle. And what he says is that the climate is our common good. And this I find interesting, because the common good is one of those, as I said, a term which, which, which few people believe in. Uh, but it was a very important term for us. It was the way we designated certain spaces which belong to no individual but belong to all individuals. And we called it the good of the community. For example, a public wharf in Newfoundland. It was the common good. Every, nobody owned it because everybody owned it. And everybody needed to own it because if you couldn't get to the water, you couldn't fish. Or uh, 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 the village green in the pre-industrial England. Or even the, 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 the churches and cathedrals of Europe. They belong to everybody. We no longer have a sense for what belongs to everybody. We've lost that sense of community, you could say, because a common good only really makes sense for our community. And Francis is calling us to think of ourselves now, once again, as a community. And he's giving us a point around which we can rally our community. He's saying, actually, we do have a common good. It's the climate. The climate is our common good. And in fact, think about it. The who could the climate belong to? The, the climate cannot be appropriated by capital. The climate cannot be possessed. It can only belong to everyone, to all life on Earth. And as such, it becomes the responsibility of all life on Earth, and particularly of that life on Earth, which has the moral responsibility, the moral power to do something about it, to look after it. So on that note, I'll, uh, I'll finish and take questions if you wish. Thank you.
Uh, so, uh, so I heard three questions. I mean, yeah. The first is the question of what, why would we go back to the pre-industrial? Well, he, he's not suggesting we go back to pre-industrial. No, no, he, uh, we can't. We can't. It's impossible. No, it, it, it's only, it, there's only a technological future for us. There's no other future for us. He's not fantasizing about a return to pre-industrial times. He's, and I'm sorry if I suggested that. And I'm not either. He's talking about a different way of using technology and integrating technology into the economy, different than the way we do it now. But it doesn't mean going back. I mean, for heaven's sakes, we're going to have 11 million people on, on the planet in 2050, uh, especially if uh, the Catholic Church is, uh, uh, has its way. Right? <laughs> so um, you know, there's no going back to the time when we were under a billion people. So that's it. There's no going back. We go reverse. And that's not the suggestion. The second uh, point was um, about moral responsibility. Um, uh, well, I think this is, a, this is the whole point of the anthropocene, that we do seem to have a responsibility here that we didn't understand before. We never understood ourselves to be responsible for the climate, for changes in the climate. And if the anthropocene is correct, then we actually are coming to a point of understanding ourselves to be responsible for the conditions of our life. Now, that's not a responsibility that we you know, took upon ourselves. Oh, aren't we so grand we can, you know, we can change geology? It was something that we discovered, right? So I, I don't, I, I don't, it seems to me that you, you talk about the sun and so on. Of course, we're not responsible for the universe. And this is why, this is why in other talks, I often discuss more about what kind of nature we're talking about here. We're not talking about the nature that is uh, exploding stars and uh, expanding uh, galaxies and so on. That's not the nature we're talking about. We're talking about the nature which forms a home for us, the little garden, you know, the Goldilocks condition under the little blue veil of the, of the climate which made possible our life. That's the nature we're talking about, a very special form of nature. Nature that's our environment. And we do seem to be responsible for it in the sense that what we do affects it. And the third point... Uh, short-term long. Short oh yeah, short-term, that's not, you said, yeah, that's what we do. We don't think about the future in capitalism. But that's not human nature. Definitely not. There's nothing natural about such thinking. That's, you know, selfishness might be human nature, but capitalism, a, a structure of short-term gain, uh, you know, or maximize self-interest, economically structured into our politics is not natural. We, we've had all many different ways of organizing ourselves. And I, I just think of traditional agrarian communities, for example, and the way they plan for the future and the next generation. Or here's, a, here's an example. The builders of the cathedrals of Europe, you know, Frobert Cathedral, my favorite, you know, it took 400 years to build a beautiful thing. Stonemasons working on that. They knew they would never actually see the fruit of their work. They would never stand back and look at my great cathedral. They gave it to the future. They weren't thinking about their short-term gain. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't think there's, there's anything particularly natural about capitalism. I think it's a, it's a construct. Thank you for your question. Yes. Uh, your reference to the common good at the, toward the end there reminded me of that essay back in, I think, it was 1969 by Gary Hart on the tragedy of the commons. Yeah, the tragedy of the commons. Which was basically the same type exactly. of thing. Exactly. At the same time, people would think about yeah. the common good as something to be shared. And then people said, well, if I just add one more cow to the commons, you know, what, how could that hurt? Yeah. Well, if everybody thought the same way, then the commons would be much depleted and more limited and so forth. So the tragedy of the commons, that's right. Yeah, well, nobody owns it. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a certain kind of society, that it becomes something that's just available to be wrecked and, 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 uh, and, and exploited, right? Uh, or it's just like, you know, the, the parts of our society, our cities that are not owned are places where like, stuff just gets dumped, or there's an old truck there, or, or a hobo sleeping there. This, these are not cherished places of our community. And this, this, is, the, this is the problem. And so the, the, in ecology, there's various ways of solving this. One is the, you know, the, the World Wildlife Federation, which says, well, let's buy it up, you know, which is, uh, you know, I'm not so sure. But what's interesting about the tragedy of the commons is that it's the tragedy of community, right? You need a community to have a common good. If there's a good that we have co in common, it means that we are a community, and we recognize it. Uh, and I think that the, the, this is related to various other political problems as well. Um, but, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, in terms of the, uh, the uh, apple concerning this, in the last couple of three days, this, this young hedge fund manager who decided to buy up this drug that's used by people with the, the, against, 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 terrorists, against parasites of certain types, a toxoplasm, I think it is, uh, where the pills were $13.50 a piece, now they're $7,500 because he, he did it because he could do it. Yeah. Just greedy. Right, yeah. but, but that's capitalism. Yeah. 
Yeah. Just water so you can do whatever you want to. Yeah. There might be other forms of capitalism that actually support the government, right? But it's too complicated. Yes. Yeah, um, and I have a question on the phone. Thank you. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about the Billy Gates and the really great idea of the downside, the dark side of all this. And you mentioned hope. Can you give us a little bit more about that? Because I've a lot of young people sitting there and right. they're not depressed when they came in here. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I started teaching environmental philosophy in 2002, um, and, uh, and I, uh, I, I was just basically creating these theaters of despair, you know? And I would end the class, and uh, they would all look at me with shock and horror on their face. And, I, and at that time, I had a child, and I realized I could no longer talk about the future this way because I was talking about my little boy's future. Uh, I had to start thinking differently about the future. Uh, and, and, uh, and I'm still struggling with that because the situation is desperate. But some things we can take consolation in. For example, um, because the situation is dire, it doesn't mean there's no hope. Uh, it, it just means that uh, we're not talking about optimism here. We're not talking about, oh, we can do it. You know, it's not Obama hope. You know, it's actually theological hope. You know, in other words, like we will give everything we have. To, 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 to make the world better, but we don't presume that we're going to be able to do it on our own steam, you know? I, I, I'm a theologian, I, just, I think I just revealed my card there. But, uh, uh, so what I've been doing uh, in my own work then is concentrating on the things we can do. So what we did on the west coast of Newfoundland is we had a festival, uh, and we had a festival about the future. Uh, and the future is a source of great anxiety, but it can also be a source of hope. Both anxiety and hope are future-oriented. So there's no hope if you're not looking into the future. You know? You've got to look to the future if you're going to hope. So you've got to look to the future in a different way. And so what we did was we gathered together everyone who had something to say or something to contribute on this, from Aboriginal leaders to dancers to artists to scientists to philosophers. And we brought them to a beautiful place. And we made sure that we didn't spend all our time talking. We talked in the morning and then we did fun things in the afternoon. We went hiking, we went on boat tours and fjords and uh, drank and ate together. And at the end of those four days, I noticed something incredible that happened. I had, we had created a community. People were connected in an important way. There was, there was love there that wasn't there before. And it occurred to me, actually, that this is something we could do. We could actually create much stronger communities. And, and then it occurred to me that this is not a small thing, because related to this question, what's the, the, the point of resistance will only be communities. It's not going to be the individual that makes a difference here. That, that is the rhetoric of another age. The individual can't make a difference. Only communities can make a difference. And communities can't obviously solve climate change, but they can reorganize their towns. I was told, for example, that there's really interesting things being done on the municipal level in the United States. Not much happening on the state level, but on the municipal level, there's very progressive and uh, visionary mayors who are at, at town council around them who are able to do things like, uh, you know, introduce, for example, streetcars downtown and uh, limit the use of traffic and so on. Or up in Fogo Island in Newfoundland, well, you can do it when you're on Fogo Island, but they banned the use of plastic bags. They just went around to all the shops and said, no more plastic bags here. Yeah, no plastic bags here. Done with plastic bags. So a community without plastic bags. But they're able to do that because they're our community. So creating communities, and which is not rocket science, it really has to do with you know, singing together, drinking together, laughing together, is a, it, it, it sets up points of resistance. And I, I think that this is something that we need to concentrate much more on. And this would lead us to pay attention to something which I didn't even mention, which is rural communities. You know, it's tragic what we've done to our rural life, how we've just let it just disintegrate. Uh, we've even in, in, in implemented policies that, that destroy it strategically. We need communities of human beings living close to the land and uh, you know, producing the food that we're eating. Uh, and, and these are things we can do. You know? we, we can encourage more uh, local agriculture around urban uh, centers. That, that can be done. It's just a matter of policy. So these are points of hope, I think. And then on the last point is simply that we don't know what the future is going to be. You know, there's this, this, is, this is not a system of determinism. The future is uncertain, which means, you know, it could be better than we fear.
That's a great place to stop. <laughs>